Good morning. I'm Pastor Ricky Smith of Gunnersville First United Methodist Church. I'm so glad you've joined us for our Tuesday morning Bible study. We continue our journey through 1 John. We're on chapter 4, and today we'll be looking at verses 12 through 21 as we continue to hear John's teaching on being in fellowship with God, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit, as well as the body of Christ. So, again, we're glad you joined us today, and let me begin by sharing those verses with you from the New King James Version. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus he is the Son of God. God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we, in this world, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If one someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So John continues to teach us about the love of God and the love of God in us and the work that that same love does in and through our hearts and lives. So John begins this portion of his letter with, no one has seen God at any time. When I look at that word seen in the Greek, it means to behold, look upon, view attentively, contemplate. What's the spirit of this word seen? It is to learn by looking. So no one has had the opportunity to physically look upon God and learn about God from that same observation. The observation made by the physical eye that leads to knowing has not beheld the form of God in its fullness. Now, we know that God has manifested God's form or presence in a variety of ways that have allowed humans to see that manifestation and not be harmed by it. We know that God's presence came in the form of fire at night in a cloud by day in the book of Exodus as God made God's presence known among the people, but as God led the people forward in the desert. We also know that God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. And we also know that God came down in a cloud and fire and thunder on the top of the mountain as God revealed himself to all of Israel there again in Exodus. Now Moses, having a very deep and close relationship with God, asked God a question or, or, or asked of God something. Moses said, Lord, if I found favor in your sight, show me your glory. Moses wanted to see and know the very essence of who God was and is. So he said, Lord, show me your glory. And then God had an interesting response, and this is from Exodus 33, verse 20 through 23. God responding to Moses' request of God showing Moses his glory, God says this, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. And the Lord said, Here's a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock, 
So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I'll take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So Moses is, is really wanting to see the face of God just as Moses would see and know and understand and identify another person by their face, just like we do. But something interesting happened in this situation with Moses and God. The greater revelation of God came from God's proclamation of who God is when God revealed God's glory to Moses. So then in chapter 34, in the early verses of the chapter, that happened that God described in chapter 33. God hid Moses in the cleft of a rock in an indention or a cave in the rock. And after God had passed by, Moses was allowed to see God as God moved away. But what is important about that moment was what God proclaimed about God's self. And this is what God proclaimed. It's in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and following. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So here we see not just the, the physical presence or manifestation of God uh, seen and known, we hear the heart of God being revealed by God's own proclamation. So in my heart and mind, that seems to be the better revelation, not some physical vision of God, but truly hearing who God is on a heart level. Now, the evidence of this God we cannot see with our physical eyes is seen in God's love within us. Now, we know when John uses the word love in reference to God's love, it's the Greek word agape. So if we agape one another or love one another with God's love, God abides in us and his love has been perfected or made complete in us. We can't agape another person or love another person with God's love without that same love of God being present in us. The agape love cannot be present in us apart from the Spirit of God in us. And there's nothing lacking in the love of God in us. God is complete. Agape is complete. Agape in us is complete. Now, we learn how to allow that love to touch and transform every part of our being. We learn how to express that love in every circumstance and relationship in life. So the completeness of the love is here, but the revealing of it and its work in our hearts and lives is a continual process. So we have to let the agape love of God do the work that that love has come to do. And it is to fill the believer and to be extended to those around us. For the sake of understanding the magnitude of such a love as agape, let's hear again an expanded definition of agape. Now again, agape is the fourth word in the Greek for love. It is described as a love that loves without changing. It is a self-giving love that gives without demanding or expecting repayment. It is love so great that it can be given to the unlovable or unappealing. It is a love that loves even when it is rejected. Agape love gives and loves because it wants to. It does not demand or expect repayment from the love given. It gives because it loves. It, lo it does not love in order to receive. And that definition is from the Enduring Word Commentary. And if you're looking for a good commentary to help you better study the Bible and understand the Word of God, I, I would commend to you, suggest to you, to Google Enduring Word Commentary on your computer 
see how easy it is to use and see how informative it is to your Bible study and, and understanding of God's word. Well, John continues in verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Now, we've talked about this in the past. We'll talk about it just a little bit right now as a refresher. Scripture clearly indicates, the very words of Jesus very clearly indicate that we, as those who have professed faith in Jesus Christ, and God's salvation has come, we are those whom the Spirit of God comes to live in and dwell. We have become the temple of the living God. Jesus told us this in John 14. Let me share those words with you again. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So, Jesus comes to us through the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit. When we place our faith in Jesus, Holy Spirit comes to live and dwell. Now, we saw the beginnings of this in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. That's when that helper came to fill and empower the church of Jesus Christ. In verse number 3 and 4 of Acts chapter 2, we hear these words. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. God's presence came as fire. And one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see in that moment all the believers that were gathered there in the upper room as Jesus had instructed them to do were filled with the Holy Spirit. He told them to remain in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father had come. And that was the promise that God's Spirit would fill those who have placed faith in Jesus Christ. So we know we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us because he has given us of his spirit. John continues in verse 14, and we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son as savior of the world. So John has both seen, handled with his hands, and heard Jesus, the incarnation of God, made manifest or revealed in the flesh. We know when John began his letter, he said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life that was with the Father and manifested to us. So John is among those who saw, who heard, who touched the physical person of God in the incarnation, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. How do we know that was the Son of God? Well, Jesus revealed himself as the Son of God, but God also proclaimed that same truth. In Matthew chapter 17, when Jesus and Peter and James and John were up on top of the mountain, Jesus was transfigured. His glory was seen. The full essence of who Jesus was in and is was seen by Peter, James, and John. So here, while Jesus is speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. I think that was Peter speaking when God began to speak, not Jesus. But even God here says, Jesus, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. So the Father in heaven bore witness that Jesus Christ was the very son of God. Now John, having seen and heard and touched the very son of God, had witnessed his life and his ministry, cannot keep his mouth shut. He must, he is compelled by the Spirit to tell others about Jesus and the good news of Jesus Christ. So John wants others to experience the fellowship of God 
through faith in Jesus Christ and have the fullness of joy present in them just as it is present in him. Now then, John goes back to one of the original purposes of the letter, and that is to speak out against heresies and false teachings that were taking place in the church in John's day. There were people in the church who eventually left the church who were teaching or saying that Jesus was God, but he was not fully human. But in order for God to accomplish what God desired to accomplish in and through the life of Jesus Christ, Jesus had to be both fully God and fully human because only being fully human could Jesus stand and be representative of all humankind and only living a sinless life dying on the cross of Calvary, bearing the weight and penalty of our sin, could Jesus provide a solution or a salvation from our sins? There he died. He was placed in the grave three days, and then he rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And now through faith in Jesus Christ, we also have victory over death, hell, and the grave. Grave no longer has a hold on us. Jesus has made that possible. So, John says in verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, Son of God, physically speaking, God abides in him and he in God. So the test of the Spirit is again mentioned here. Confession that Jesus is the Son of God, fully human, fully divine, is evidence of the Spirit of God in us. We cannot do this without God abiding in us and we in God. That's the only way we, with confidence and full assurance, are going to say, yes, Jesus is the Son of God, fully human, fully divine, and the Savior of the world. John goes on in verse number 16 saying, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a powerful verse and a powerful statement about who we are in Christ Jesus right now in this moment. It's so powerful, I want to read it to you again, okay? Love has been perfected or made complete among us in this or in this way, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment we must remember we will all stand before the great white throne of God for judgment. Because as he, Jesus, is, so are we in this world. Now, I know the mention of judgment sometimes puts a little bit of anxiety in the heart and the mind of people. But for the believer, it should not. Why? Because... God's love has been complete or made complete among us. Love has been perfected among us. And the evidence of it is that we will have boldness on the day of judgment because as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Now, let me explain that a little bit. The perfect love of God in us, doing its perfect work in us, prepares us to stand with confidence and without fear before God on that day of judgment. Every moment of every day that we live in God's love is another moment of preparation for us for that same day of judgment. At that moment, judgment, we are judged 
according to what the love of God has done in and through our lives. The love of God is working hard in and through our lives, helping us to be witnesses of Christ and followers of Christ, sharing the love of Christ each and every day that we live. As we get it right here, because of God's work in us, we will have boldness there on that day. Our boldness will not be based on our love, our works, our righteousness, or anything that is of ourselves. But our boldness will be due to God's love, God's work, and God's righteousness in us. That's where the boldness will come from. This is all the more reason why we need to embrace the love of God. Even when it challenges us, we are still in need of transformation and sanctification. We still need the Holy Spirit of God and the love of God to do a deeper work in us. And as we welcome that and invite that and surrender ourselves to that, we are better prepared for the day we will stand before God and give an account for our lives. On the day of judgment, we will stand before the love, capital L, that has filled and guided our lives for years. That love, capital L, God, who stands as judge over us, should see the fullness of his love in us. And that, my dear friends, should give us confidence and boldness on that day. Now then, John shared with us another powerful statement, and that is this. As he is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Now let me go back to the Enduring Word commentary and share a couple of thoughts from there. How is Jesus right now? in the present day. Well, he's glorified. There's nothing being held back from the fullness of his glory now. He is forever righteous and bold. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And John is telling us, spiritually speaking, we can have that same standing right now while we are in the world through faith in Jesus Christ because as he is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Now, certainly this glory of God in us, this Christ in us, is right now just in its beginning stages. It's in seed form. It has not yet fully been developed into what it will be, but we and Jesus are working on that. But it is there, and its presence is demonstrated by our love for one another in our agreement with God's truth. All that serves to give us boldness. Boldness now, and certainly boldness on the day of judgment. Now let me also share another word from a commentary with you this morning. This is the Adam Clark commentary. Another very good commentary to use if you're trying to get a deeper understanding of the word of God. Hear what Adam Clark has to write about that same statement of John. Pure, holy, and loving, so are we in this world, being saved from our sins and made like to himself in righteousness and true holiness. No man can contemplate the day of judgment with any comfort or satisfaction but on this ground, that the blood of Christ has cleansed him from all sin and that he is kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. This will give him boldness in the day of judgment. So those are some very strong and comforting words that we need to hold deeply in our hearts, in our lives, today and forevermore. And as we consider these things in verse number 17, we can better understand verse number 18. Here, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 
The word fear in the Greek means to be put in alarm or fright. There is no need to cower before God now or at the judgment because there is no fear in the love of God that's in us transforming our hearts and lives by that same love. When love does its complete work in us, fear is cast out in reference to God. We reverence God, but we are not afraid of God as if God is going to bring harm to us. Fear involves torment, and God does not want to rob us of the peace and the assurance his love has brought to our lives. Why would God give us peace and assurance through the presence of God's love and then cause us to be afraid and rob us of that same peace? God's not going to work that way. We fear God in reverence, but not in fear of in a way that robs us of the great gifts God has given to us. Now, if we fear God in a way that brings terror and torment, we've, we still have room for more maturity in the things of God's spirit and the things of God's love. We've not yet been made perfect are complete in that same love. The love is complete. It needs to have its perfect work in us. And then again, John reminds us, we love him because he first loved us. And you know, I don't know if there's any greater expression of our love for Jesus than we, when we confess our love for Jesus. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus shares these words. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Well, guess what? Jesus has confessed God's love toward every human being on the face of the earth. Now, the question is, will we confess Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior? And will we confess our love for Jesus before God and before all the world to see and to hear. Remember, whoever denies Jesus before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Wow. Let us be a great confessor of Christ through our confession of our love from God. John goes on to remind us, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? We forget sometimes of the great enmity, enmity between the Jews and the Gentiles in God's day. God had instructed the Jews to be a separate people, to not engage in the things of the Gentiles, because God knew that if the Jews mingled with the Gentiles to a point and a degree that they would pick up the habits and the customs and the religious practices of the Gentiles and then the Jews' relationship with God would be hindered, hurt, or even destroyed. So there was a separation made there to keep the Jews in perfect or complete relationship with God. Now, through Jesus Christ, that wall of separation has been torn down and God has called all people to him through faith in Jesus Christ. So the Jews are still struggling a bit with loving the Gentiles. But John reminds them, it's the love of God in you that prepares you and compels you to love all your brothers and sisters in Christ. There were many Gentiles in the early church in John's day. So now they had to have a renewing of their mind, a transformation of the heart by the very love of God in them. And John reminds his brothers and sisters in the church, if you say I love God and you say you hate your Gentile uh, brother or sister in the church, then guess what? How can the love of God be in you? The love of God in you is evidenced by the love of God being expressed through you. And then he reminds us in verse 21, and this commandment we have from him, from Jesus, that he who loves God must love his brother also. 
Why is that? It is because God loves us all. John 3, 16. God desires to see everyone come to faith, come to relationship with him through Jesus Christ. God wants to share his love with everyone, so God's love in us wants to be shared through us to all of our brothers and sisters in Christ around us. I hope this has been an encouraging word for you today. I hope it strengthens your spirit. I hope it gives you guidance in your life on how to love others and to protect that same love and be the disciple of Jesus Christ God has called and gifted you to be empowered and compelled by his love. I hope you have a blessed week, and until next Tuesday, uh, may God's richest blessings be with and upon you.